Live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And happening now, cities across Texas remembering loved ones who've been lost to gun violence. And the focus is on children. The Marcha de los Niños event happening in San Antonio, in Austin, as well as other cities all across the state. Yeah, let's go to Austin now, where the families of the Uvalde victims are there calling for fundamental changes to protect children from gun violence. As a matter of fact, the march is beginning where they're actually going to march from the Capitol, which is kind of what we see right there. They're going to march from the Capitol to the governor's mansion. They're asking lawmakers to raise the age to 21 in order to buy an assault style rifle. Yeah, our camera's getting set up there to join this group along their march to the governor's mansion in front of the podium where this event is happening, where it's going to end up. An ofrenda has been set up with the faces of the victims of the Robb Elementary School shooting. Families say that calling for action like this is the best way to honor their loved ones killed in mass shootings. They want to keep this from happening anywhere else. Yeah, there you see the ofrenda going by. Also pictures of some of the loved ones who have been killed. As we said, this is a bigger than just the Uvalde families, but the Uvalde families are taking part in this march in Austin. Yeah, certainly made more significant by what happened in Uvalde. And at the same time, there was an event happening right here in San Antonio. A group will march from Confluence Park to Mission Concepcion. Our Patty Santos is live at Mission Concepcion. Patty, what's the scene there? Yeah, we wanted to bring you here to Mission Concepcion. This is where the uh, the event will end because we wanted to show you the beautiful ofrenda. These are the photos of the 21 victims, gun violence victims that were killed in Uvalde, as well as the names of other gun violence victims that have been killed in Texas shootings. Now, again, the event is going to start around 6.15 at Confluence Park. The uh, state lawmakers will speak there. there. Then they're going to make their way through the park park trail over to Thiel and over here to the mission. They're timing this out to take about 21 minutes uh, to walk over here, of course, in honor of the 21 victims. And again, the March for the Children uh, is going to end here at the mission. Uh, they're trying to time it out as well with the mass that's going on. So they're thinking around 745. We already see a few folks that have been making their way here uh, for the ending here. They're going to try to have the priest as well give a blessing. There's going to be a vigil and there's going to be mariachis. We're going to have uh, pictures for you showing you what that looks like, of course, on KSAT.com and tonight on the Night Beat. We'll send it back to you. Thank you, Patty. And as the march to remember those lost gun violence begins, there was another case of gun violence on San Antonio streets. A fist fight between two teens ended with both in the hospital after shooting started. The Bear County Sheriff's Office responded to a shooting at about 1:45 this afternoon on FM 78 near Ventura Way. That's by the Converse City limits in northeast Bear County. The sheriff said a 15 year old and 18 year old were fighting while a group of bystanders just watched. A small white import sedan pulled up, he said, and at least one of the occupants started shooting. Both teenagers hit, though the sheriff said the 15 year old ended up getting in the car with the shooter. Obviously, we, in our in our estimation, we believe that at least the 15 year old suspect knows or victim knows who was in that vehicle. And so we'll be talking to, to both combatants at this point and any witnesses. One of the teenagers, the 15 year old dropped at an address on a nearby street, but both teenagers ended up being taken by ambulance to Bamsey, neither facing charges at this time. Though the sheriff said that could change depending on what led up to the initial fist fight. An 18 month old shot at a Halloween party. Investigators say the weapon was fired by a woman who was playing with a gun there, and now she's facing charges. 33 year old Eloisa Fraga was arrested after the toddler was shot on Sunday. A warrant says that a, the baby was unconscious and had a gunshot wound to the chest. Investigators say the child's parents told doctors a different story, though, that the baby was holding a cell phone and it exploded in the child's hands. Witnesses told police that Fraga was allegedly mishandling that gun during the incident. She was taken into custody on Monday and is now charged with aggravated assault. The tonight, Bear County Sheriff's deputies are asking for help in identifying a sexual assault suspect. BCSO says the assault happened yesterday around 1030 in the morning in the 11,800 block of Davalos Lane. It's in West Bear County. Deputies say the suspect entered a home through an open garage and assaulted a woman. The man is described as being slender, about five feet, nine inches tall. 
He was last seen wearing a black t-shirt, dark colored sweatpants. Anyone with information can call BCSO at 210-335-6000. And San Antonio police and Crime Stoppers asking for your help to find the person who shot and killed a teenager on the north side two years ago. SAPD says that Darnilio Garza was ambushed around 4.30 in the morning. This happened in July 2020. It happened at the 7600 block of McCullough Avenue near Oblate. Officers believe that Garza was set up. Just before that shooting, police say that he got a message on Instagram telling Garza to meet them outside. Anyone with any information is asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. A jury right now as we speak deliberating how many years in jail for a San Antonio mother found guilty yesterday of the murder of her young daughter. The state seeking life in prison and the defense looking for some mercy from that jury. Brionis convicted of the 2017 murder of her four-year-old daughter Olivia Brionis. Before the jury went into deliberations, she took the stand and while she stood by her story that all Olivia's injuries were accidents, she did say she should have asked for help. I know there's a lot of ways that I failed her. And I know I should have reached out for help. The sentence for Jessica Brionis could be anywhere from five to 99 years or life in prison for the murder conviction. You can stay with KSAT 12 and KSAT.com for the latest on when the jury makes their decision. In Houston, a member of the Grammy nominated rap group Migos has died after a shooting outside of a bowling alley there. Kirsnik Kahari Ball, also known as Takeoff, was killed in that shooting early this morning. It happened around 2.30 a.m. Authorities say that security guards heard that shooting, but they did not see who was behind it. Right now, Houston police are looking through any evidence they can find. They do have surveillance video cameras here in the, uh, the complex. Uh, our investigators have reviewed the cameras and are still in the process of reviewing them. Uh, so once they're finished doing that, we'll have more information, like I said, later on. Two other people were injured in this shooting and taken to a nearby hospital. Takeoff was 28 years old. On the ballot securing schools, the Judson ISD adds a nearly $350 million election bond. Board discussions began shortly after the Robb Elementary massacre with trustees focusing on safety and security to prevent a threat on campuses. But it does come with a tax rate increase. Our Alicia Barrera sat down with the superintendent of schools to break down these two propositions that voters will decide on. Judson ISD says the proposed property tax increase of one cent is minimal. So this one cent would be approximately about $15 a year for a home that's valued at about 150,000. Voters will decide on two propositions. Prop A addresses safety and security, including radios for police officers. We've all learned a lot from Uvalde and the importance to be able to communicate and make sure we're all on the same frequency. Everything from updating fences, updating cameras, updating uh, technology for the cameras, um, making sure that we have secure entrances, uh, vestibules. According to the school district, when it comes to cameras and securities alone, that's quoted to be over $3 million dollars, but this isn't just about helping prevent school shootings. It could also help when addressing bullying or fights inside the school. The more cameras we have, the better investigations that we can do. Prop B focuses on added bus transportation and a new elementary and middle school as enrollment has increased by 1,200 this year. Our goal is to not have portable spit, to have a building where all our students can be under one roof. And after last year's bond failed at the polls, the need and price has grown. Well, last year we were going to build a middle school and that was at $70 million. To build that same exact middle school right now, it's $120 million. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. And just a reminder, early voting still happening this week. Right now on KSAT.com, we have everything you need to know ahead of Election Day, including sample ballots and polling locations. We'll also bring you live updates on Election Night during our election live stream. That starts right after our 6 o'clock news around 7 o'clock.
The hotel industry has certainly taken a hit over the last couple of years, and although some problems are cooling down, others seem to be ramping back up. We visited the Estancia del Norte Hotel 10 months ago to see how they were dealing with supply chain and staffing issues. We went back out today to see what's changed. Turns out the supply chain problem still exists, but it's not the top priority. The hotel's ownership has been able to change some brands of things like shampoo and toilet paper. And get this, they're sharing supplies between hotels. The major issue wreaking havoc right now is a staffing shortage. We're having to figure out how to adapt to um, remote work, which is crazy because hospitality is all about like engagement with people. Um, and everyone's wanting the remote work or hybrid work option. So we're having to look into options for that. After the pandemic triggered mass layoffs, some people have been afraid to go back. So hotel groups like the Presidian are beginning to offer those hybrid schedules, improve their benefits, and even offer continuing education. Like the little jingle, it's November 1st. That means the KSAT team participating in a no shave November to raise money for cancer research, treatment and prevention. Here's a look at who's joining in this fundraiser, both on air talent and behind the scene crews. The fundraising effort has been going on since 20 to, excuse me, 2009. Last year, Team KSAT raised more than $20,000. We want to do more than that this year. Scan this QR code to learn about the 13 cancer foundations that will benefit from this fundraiser. You can also find information on how to donate and read about why each member of the team is participating. You know, I said at five o'clock, some people started over the weekend. Yeah. Justin Horn confirmed that was him. He did start over the weekend. <laughs> Maybe Justin Horn needs to. I'm just saying it's a speculation. I realize, but I'm just all, all I know is there was there. scruff there today when I saw him. Right. OK, let's take a little bit for to look at 410 and Jackson Keller slow going in some areas, but real no big problems out there on the roads right now. And as we take a look at live cam, you can see some clouds off in the distance. There are actually some dark clouds for a good part of the day, but not a lot of rain once the day started. Adam. Yeah, it may have looked like it, you know, could rain at any point, but we didn't get a whole lot locally. Let's take a look at live radar and some mid-level clouds, even a few sprinkles being picked up closer to the Gulf Coast line. You look at the 24 rain, 24 hour rainfall estimates and where you get the yellow on the right hand side of your screen far east of San Antonio. We're talking closer to Edna, Victoria, Goliad. That's where it's two plus inches of rainfall. Nonetheless, in Quero, about eight tenths of an inch. You get in parts of Gonzales County, a quarter of an inch down near Kennedy, about a half an inch in and around San Antonio, generally under a quarter of an inch, but there were some exceptions. And we zoom in here to the south, southeast side. This is Loop 410 here, I-37, Southeast military between a half inch to an inch, not far from Mission San Juan. So some obviously lo localized areas picked up some better accumulations this evening. 70 right now, gradually dropping to the mid 60s by 10 o'clock. And by the way, if you did miss out on the rain, another opportunity exists. We'll time that out for you and talk about the severe potential in a bit. Tomorrow marks one month since Eric Cantu was shot in a McDonald's parking lot. With the help of Eric's family, the community is set to return to the scene of the shooting tonight. We'll also be there as questions still surround Cantu's recovery. Today, the San Antonio Fire Department kicked off its fundraiser for muscular dystrophy patients. After being put on hold because of the pandemic, the SAFD Fill the Boot campaign is back on. San Antonio firefighters will be on street corners collecting donations for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. A local MDA family today helped the fire department kick off this fundraiser. Two organizations coming together to increase accessibility to a historic park on the city's south side. Today, the San Antonio River Authority and AM San Antonio announced plans to help a spot a park thanks to a donation. There are plans to create an outdoor learning laboratory for things like field experiments. They also want to add more amenities like benches. Planning is set to begin soon. The university says construction could begin within the next five years. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 flying high above Confluence Park, and this is where uh, the March for the Children, Marcha de los Niños, it began here and will end up 
at Mission Concepcion uh, as that crowd is gathering. It's supposed to start here any minute now. Yeah, it may have already left mm -hmm. Confluence Park for all we know, but they will end up at Mission Concepcion. Meanwhile, weather not a problem for this March, Adam. No, not at all, actually. Pretty agreeable out there currently and seasonable. Feels kind of fall like outside. Now, I do want to point out if you missed out on the rainfall that we had last night and earlier today, there is another opportunity. But between now and then, we have got some patchy fog. The next, I think, several mornings, but you know, starting off tomorrow morning, very humid Thursday and Friday. You'll notice the stickiness, and then that's going to lead to our next storm chance late Friday. We're talking Friday evening could even affect some football games. Take a look at our rain chances there. You know, we've got 20% Thursday, even on into the first half of Friday, but that's really just for a few little pop up quick splash and dash, very light showers, probably not even you know, causing any issues on the roadways. It's Friday evening when a cold front it's going to move in and could trigger some scattered thunderstorms. I do think, however, they would be very brief in nature. So let's talk about the overall pattern and what we're watching. First of all, this little swirl, swirl near Oklahoma City. That's the upper level component to what gave us some showers last night and this morning. It's moving out of here. We're focusing on this big dip, that big trough in the upper level flow in the western U.S. here. You really see that circulation associated with it, that counterclockwise giving us the lift. That's our next system, that big dip in the upper level flow. That's going to be dropping southward, already bringing shower activity and precipitation from central California northward all the way into Montana and Canada. And as we go through time, as this digs southward through the western U.S., as it moves towards San Antonio, it's going to dump some snow in the higher elevations. And then around here, once it gets closer by Friday, Friday evening, a cold front's going to swing through and that's going to kickstart what we think will be some scattered showers and thunderstorms. But here's the key takeaway. And I know this is so often the case for us. We're going to be right on the tail end of the activity Friday evening. The bulk of it is going to be off to the north of us. So we could see a thin line of thunderstorms, maybe even a severe thunderstorm or two move on in around and a little after sunset on Friday. Of course, a lot of time between now and then we'll be fine tuning this forecast and providing the updates as we get new data. But we're still in first place. And this is a first place I don't like for the driest year on record so far. Year to date, 2022 is the driest, but we're not far from creeping up on 1917. OK, so we could do that on Friday. Cross your fingers. We'll see. Dew points right now, upper 50s near 60. Not bad. They really rise Thursday and Friday. Sticky dew points in the 60s all day. Then they fall off for the weekend. The weekend's going to be very fall like and crisp. Not so much every other day in the seven day forecast. Right now we're right around 70 degrees. 67 New Braunfels, Seguin here at 65, Hondo up to 74. Carrizo Springs 73, officially 70 in town in San Antonio. We'll start the day tomorrow. Upper 50s right near 60, even some lower 60s south of town. Catula, Pleasanton 62, get up into the hill country, Canyon Lake 59, Fredericksburg and Kerrville 57 in the morning. Then by the afternoon, we boost well into the 70s. Hello to 77 along with Stone Oak, Lavernia 77. And for the most part, I mean, upper 70s, not far from 80 degrees. We go from the patchy fog early to some sunshine into the afternoon mixed in with clouds and that high temperature around 77 east southeasterly wind at 5 to 15. I do want to point out morning temperatures will be all over the place from near 70 Friday morning back down to the upper 40s by Sunday morning. So the cold fronts affecting us a bit at the weekend, sunny, fall like and falling back. Oh, that's right. The Thanks time. for the reminder. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. All right, so they have been they're having a great season. Mm -hmm. They're called the Road Runners, but <laughs> they're Road Warriors this year, Greg. Well, and they have to be against this team they're going to face next up, UAB, because that's been very difficult for them to win on the road against this particular team. When we come back, we'll tell you how difficult, plus the importance of bowl eligibility as well when it comes to the fighting Texas Aggies. They got some work to do to get there. Coming up. 
Gentlemen, the UTSA Roadrunners resume their season after a week off. They will be just one point favorites when they travel to Birmingham to take on UAB. That's after they were able to defeat their rivals, North Texas, 31 27, by outscoring the Mean Green in the fourth quarter of their last game, 21 14. That win put the Roadrunners at 4 0 in Conference USA, 6 2 overall in the driver's seat to repeat as Conference USA champions. But keep in mind, the Blazers lead this series at four games to two and have won both previous matchups in Birmingham. So, what will it take to beat UAB on their home turf coming off their bye week? Being physical, uh, that's our motto is run the ball and being physical. Uh, physical toughness is this coach play of the week and we're going to really try to um, out uh, physical them. We took a lot of a pride in our recovery and, and our cryo and, and uh, getting in the training room and, and getting our, our minds uh, kind of off of football and like our bodies off of football and taking a, taking a little step back and feeling, feeling good and coming into UAB. All right, kickoff on the road this Saturday against UAB will be at 2.30 p.m. Like the UTSA Roadrunners, the Texas Longhorns are coming off a bye week, but unlike the Roadrunners, Longhorns are coming off a loss to Oklahoma State 41-34. Now they have to face 13th-ranked Kansas State in Manhattan this Saturday after the Wildcats knocked off the Cowboys 48 to nothing to improve to 6-2 overall, 4-1 in the Big 12. Has head coach Steve Sarkeesian found a common theme on UT's inability to win on the road this season, not counting the neutral site for OU? The common theme is us getting a, a little outside of ourselves when adversity strikes late in the ball game, uh, when, when fourth quarter rolls around. I mean, I, I felt pretty good going into the locker room in Stillwater last week and coming out of the locker room. And for whatever reason, you know, things didn't go our way and we didn't quite play to the level that I know we're capable of playing. Uh, didn't quite make the plays that I think we're accustomed to making. Um, but I, I think the, the preparation going into the ball game, I feel really good about. I feel really good about the guys executing the plan when we get in those moments. Uh, I think ultimately um, we have to do a really good job of a staff of continuing to instill confidence in our players that, that they're in the right position to go make the plays that we want them to make. Uh, and I think we'll do that. All right, kickoff in Manhattan this Saturday night it's at 6 p.m. While the Texas Longhorns have struggled on the road, the fight in Texas Aggies have just struggled, period. They are in the middle of a very unexpected four-game losing streak that has included three straight losses on the road to Mississippi State, of course, Alabama, and South Carolina, and most recently at home to Ole Miss, 31-28. Now they will have to host Florida on Saturday, where they are three-and-a-half-point favorites, where both teams come into the showdown at 1-4 in the SEC. Now, after starting this season competing for national championship, the Aggies are just hoping to become bowl eligible. How important is that with four games left? Well, it's you always important. You always want to go to a bowl game. I think it always helps. That, that's one of your that's one of your goals in which you sit, and and that gives you 15 more practices and and not, and as much as anything, to do that before you even go to the bowl game, you know, or 15 or 12 or how many. Usually it's around 14, 15 practices, and that's time for your guys. Anytime you play, you get better, and it's you want to keep your you always want to be a bowl. That's one of your goals is to be in a bowl, and that's one of our goals, and we need to do that. All right, kick off at Kyle Field on Saturday morning is set for 11 a.m. And keep in mind, in order to become bowl eligible, they're going to have to win three of their last four games of the regular season. So a tough task still to follow. All right, mm -hmm. and Greg, stay with us. Because well, you're going to want to tune in. You don't have to stay. With okay, you can go back to the I can go back. Play. We're going to talk to the mayor next, and we're going to talk to him about a little baseball and football. Yeah, I wonder yeah. why. Mm -hmm. We'll just see what he has to say. Here Stick you go. Around Greg Simmons. <laughs> I will. And everybody else. We'll be right back.